people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Pratiksha Mishra with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. India is increasingly focusing on the Global South to enhance socio-economic engagement and foster mutually beneficial partnerships with developing nations. This strategy aims to position India as a leader among emerging economies, leveraging its historical ties and share challenges with countries in Africa, Latin America and Asia. Recently, Jamaican Prime Minister Andrew Holness visited India, highlighting this commitment. Take a look. Jamaican Prime Minister Andrew Holness engaged in bilateral talks with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in New Delhi. Both leaders expressed their commitment to usher in a new era of collaboration, strengthening ties across various sectors. PM Modi emphasized the rich tapestry of shared history and cultural connections between India and Jamaica, highlighting their common interests in cricket, the Commonwealth and the Caribbean community. In a significant move, Hollis expressed his interest in joining the Global Biofuel Alliance, an initiative spearheaded by India during its G20 presidency aimed at promoting biofuels as a key component of the global energy transition. Our shared interests premised on our respective national targets to diversify our energy mix by 2030 provide a platform for deeper cooperation in this sphere. I am therefore pleased to announce Jamaica's intention to join the Global Biofuels Alliance pioneered by the Government of India. Through initiatives like the International Solar Alliance and collaborations in sectors such as renewable energy, technology transfer and sustainable development, India aims to provide support that aligns with the needs of Africa. The emphasis on mutual growth is evident in India's foreign aid programs which prioritize infrastructure development, healthcare and education in partner countries. फोर सीस हमारे संबंधों को अंकित करते हैं कल्चर क्रिकेट कॉमनवेल्थ और कैरिकॉम आज की बैठक में हमने सभी क्षेत्रों में अपना सहयोग सुदृढ़ करने पर विचार किया और कई नए इनिशिएटिव्स की पहचान की during its G20 presidency last year, India welcomed the African Union's chairperson, Azali Asumani, to the G20 leaders' table, making the African Union the second regional bloc to join after the EU. This inclusion, driven by India's initiative, aims to enhance the G20's effectiveness. India is also advocating for reforms in international institutions to better represent the Global South, ensuring these nations have a stronger voice in global governance. By strengthening economic ties through trade agreements and investments, India seeks to create a more balanced and equitable global economic landscape. This approach bolsters India's geopolitical standing and contributes to sustainable development in the global south, fostering stability and prosperity in a rapidly changing world. In a world increasingly defined by conflict and humanitarian crisis, India is stepping up as a pivotal advocate for global cooperation through a strong diplomatic approach that emphasizes dialogue, inclusivity and multilateralism. India is not only addressing immediate issues but also promoting long-term solutions. India's external affairs minister S. A. Shankar's recent address at the United Nations General Assembly highlights the need for collective action and a more representative global governance framework. A report. 
We will use our tenure to bring human-centric and inclusive solutions to matters of international peace and security. India will be a voice for the developing world. India has emerged as a pivotal player in the international arena, particularly in addressing global conflicts and promoting peace. Drawing from its rich history of diplomacy, commitment to multilateralism and emphasis on humanitarian values, India is strategically positioning itself as a mediator and advocate for peaceful resolutions in various crises worldwide. India's diplomatic approach has been characterized by a steadfast commitment to peace and dialogue, alongside a balanced engagement with both traditional allies and emerging partners. This multifaceted strategy enables India to navigate complex geopolitical landscapes while fostering cooperation among diverse nations. In a powerful address to the United Nations General Assembly, India's External Affairs Minister Subramaniam Jai Shankar urged world leaders to collaborate in addressing ongoing conflicts. He highlighted the necessity of collective action, calling for a unified response to the urgent challenges faced by the international community. The UN has always maintained that peace and development go hand in hand. Yet, when challenges to one have emerged, due regard has not been given to the other. Clearly, their economic implications for the weak and vulnerable need to be highlighted. But we must also recognize that conflicts themselves must be resolved. The world cannot be fatalistic about the continuation of violence on a large scale. No more than be impervious to its broader consequences. Whether it is the war in Ukraine or the conflict in Gaza, the international community seeks urgent solutions. These sentiments must be acknowledged and acted upon. Amid ongoing global conflicts, India's positive and proactive diplomatic stance has become increasingly significant. The country has consistently expressed deep concern over the humanitarian impact of these conflicts which have resulted in devastating loss of life and widespread displacement affecting millions of civilians. This unwavering commitment to humanitarian issues underscores India's understanding of the profound human cost of war and its dedication to alleviating suffering. In this context, Jai Shankar emphasized the urgent need for a more inclusive and representative global governance framework. His remarks align closely with India's overarching diplomatic philosophy, reflecting a commitment to ensuring that the voices of all nations are heard and considered in shaping key international decisions. By advocating for a more equitable global system, India aims to foster cooperation and understanding, ultimately contributing to more effective resolutions to the challenges facing the world today. Large parts of the world cannot be left behind when it comes to deciding the key issues of our times. An effective and efficient UN, a more representative UN, and a UN fit for purpose in the contemporary era is essential. Let us therefore send out a clear message from this UNGA session. We are determined not to be left behind by coming together, sharing experiences, pooling resources, and strengthening our resolve. We can change the world for the better. As the world grapples with the ongoing conflicts, India's call for cooperation and understanding serves as a beacon of hope for a more peaceful and equitable future. The road ahead may be challenging, but with shared resolve, positive change is within reach. Time now for Asia this week, the stories from across the continent.
Devout Hindus across India are flocking to temples to celebrate Navratri, a vibrant nine-night festival dedicated to Goddess Durga. Temples are beautifully adorned for the function with devotees standing in serpentine queues, chanting hymns and offering prayers to seek the blessings of the Goddess. According to Hindu beliefs, Goddess Durga embodies the essence of feminine power, guiding and vanquishing all evil from the earth. The start of Navratri also coincides with the Hindu New Year, further enhancing the significance of these joyful celebrations. India, Nepal and Bangladesh on Thursday signed a trilateral agreement to trade 40 megawatts of electricity. The agreement signed in Kathmandu now enables Nepal to sell electricity to a third country for the first time. Nepal only has been exporting electricity to India, its southern neighbour. The Indian side has also been involved in the trade deal as Nepal's electricity will be transmitted to Bangladesh through the transmission infrastructure in India. Nepal and Bangladesh are not territorially linked to each other. Nepal is estimated to sell 144,000 megawatt hour of electricity in five months, mid-June to mid-November, at the rate of 6.4 US cents a unit. The agreement was signed in the presence of Nepal's Energy Minister Deepak Kharka, Bangladeshi Minister Saida Rizwana Hassan, and India's Ambassador to Nepal, Naveen Srivastava. I'm confident, therefore, that today's agreement between these three entities would boost power sector cooperation between Nepal, India and Bangladesh. It would also signal to investors to invest in Nepal's hydropower sector because they would be assured of markets not just in India but also in Bangladesh now. The agreements signed today therefore would lead to greater energy security between our three countries. North Korea held a traditional ceremony on 3rd of October to mark the founding of ancient Korea. Video provided by news agency KCNA showed officials paying their respects at a memorial service for Tangun, believed to be the ancestral father of the nation. South Korea also commemorates the day, with some scholars insisting that Tangun or Dangun in South Korea is not a mythical character but a historical figure who actually ruled a prehistoric kingdom in Korea in 2333 BC. According to Korean legend, Dangun was the son of a god who wanted to be a man and a beard who wanted to be a woman. Israel has declared UN Chief Antonio Guterres persona non grata, effectively banning him from entry due to what it describes as his failure to condemn Iran's missile attacks on the country. Israel's Foreign Minister Israel Kutz made the announcement regarding the ban, while Guterres has condemned the ongoing escalation in the Middle East following Iran's rocket barrage on Israel, he did so without explicitly naming any country. In a crucial meeting, an IMF delegation and Sri Lankan officials evaluated the progress of the ongoing economic reform program. They discussed next steps for releasing the fourth tranche of the $2.9 billion financing package. Earlier, President Anura Kumara Desanayake had emphasized the need for stability and confidence in the economy, pledging immediate negotiations with the IMF and relevant creditors to expedite debt restructuring and relief efforts. An IMF delegation met with Sri Lankan officials to review the progress of the ongoing IMF program. Both parties assessed the achievements so far and discussed the next steps, including measures required for the release of the four tranche of the $2.9 billion financing package. The IMF delegation commended the significant reforms taking place in Sri Lanka, which have enhanced the country's positive economic outlook under the current government. Last month, newly elected President Anura Kumara Desanayake had spoken about renegotiating the IMF deal to ease the burden on the poor, which he argued was a consequence of the agreement signed under the previous administration.
එහෙත් ඒ සියල්ල රැඳී පවතින්නේ වර්තමාන ආර්ථික තුළ ස්ථාවරත්ව හා විශ්වාසය ගොඩනැන්වීමෙන් පමණයි. ඒ සඳහා ජාත්‍යන්තර මූල්‍ය අරමුදල සමග කඩිනමින් සාකච්ඡා ආරම්භ කර විස්තීර ණය පහසුකමට අදාළ කටයුතු ඉදිරියට ගෙන යාමට අප අදාස් කරනවා. ණය ප්‍රතිවගත කරන වැඩසටහන ඉදිරියට ගෙන යාම සඳහා අදාළ ණය පාර සමග සාකච්ඡා කර ඒ සම්බන්ධ කටයුතු හැකි ඉක්මනින් නිම කර අදාළ ණය සහන ලබා ගැනීමට අපි කටයුතු කරනවා. ඒ සඳහා මේ රටේ ජනතාව වගේම ජාත්‍යන්තර ප්‍රජාවගේ සහයෝගයත් ලබා ගත හැකි බවට අප විශ්වාස කරනවා. ඒ සහයෝගය තුලින් අපිට සාමූහික ජයග්‍රහණ කළ හැකි බව අපි තරයේ විශ්වාස කරනවා. This is Nike a Marxist leaning parliamentarian secured the presidency with the support of millions of Sri Lankans who were drawn to his commitments to reduce taxes combat corruption and lower the cost of living In his victory speech he presented a vision for Sri Lanka that is both hopeful and critical of previous governments He recognized the enduring aspiration for a brighter future that resonates deeply with the Sri Lankan populace This anike stressed the importance of the present movement referring to it as a final opportunity to bring about substantial change He urged for national unity to bridge divisions and foster a society that appreciates and embraces diversity Alutirak paayana hema dawasakama me rati sielu munisun dakina sihiniyak tibena e adata wada honda hetak ehet dasaka gananawat tisse sihiniya pamanak wu bawa obat mamat danna karuna awasthawadi balalobi ekadhipatiwade ha jatiwade hetu අපේ රට තවමත් ඉහෙලින් ඔසවා තබන්න අපිට හැකියාව ලැබිලා නැහැ. එහෙත් දැන් අපට ඉතිහාසය අත්හළ නොහැකි අවස්ථාව ලැබී තිබෙනවා. අප සියලු දෙනා එකට එක්ව විවිධත්වයන් දරා ගන්න පොහොසත් ලස්සන රටක් ගොඩනගමු. The future of Sri Lanka as discussed during the team's meetings with officials hinges on the outcome of ongoing negotiations with the IMF and the subsequent implementation of reforms. by prioritizing fiscal responsibility promoting social equity enhancing institutional capacity and fostering a conducive environment for investment sri lanka can work towards a more stable and prosperous future however addressing the challenges of political stability and public resistance will be critical in navigating the complex landscape ahead the successful implementation of these reforms has the potential to lay the foundation for a resilient economy and an inclusive society in a mixed economic landscape pakistan's annual consumer price inflation dropped to 6.9% in september the lowest in over 3 years while this decline may seem encouraging experts warn that the country's economic challenges are far from resolved The government is now tasked with implementing strict conditions from a recently approved 7 billion dollars IMF loan which includes significant tax hikes and increased electricity prices. Take a look. In September, Pakistan's annual consumer price inflation slowed to 6.9%, a notable decline and the lowest level recorded in over 3 years. This decrease in inflation may seem like a positive development on the surface. However, experts caution that the country's economic challenges are far from over. The government is now focused on implementing stringent conditions set by the International Monetary Fund as part of a recently approved 7 billion US dollars loan program. These conditions are designed to stabilize Pakistan's economy but include harsh measures such as increased taxes on farm incomes and higher electricity bills. These measures are expected to impact households significantly, leading to concerns about financial strains for many families already grappling with rising living costs. The fear among citizens is palpable as the burden of higher taxes and utility bills could exacerbate existing hardships. Many families are anxious about their ability to afford basic necessities, let alone cope with additional expenses. मेरे ख्याल में देखें आप लोन सात की बजाय आप 
भले डबल भी हो जाए हमें लोन मिल जाए लेकिन पाकिस्तान की हालत सुधरने वाली नहीं है जब तक के जब तक के हुकूमत स्टैब्लिशमेंट हमारे इदारे ये फैसला नहीं करेंगे कि हमें सबसे पहले करप्शन को ख़त्म करना है अगर हम करप्शन ख़त्म कर लेंगे तो पाकिस्तान की अपने जो रिसोर्सेज हैं उससे भी हम बहुत कुछ कर सकते हैं Pakistan's economy has long been characterized by cycles of growth followed by significant downturns a phenomenon often referred to as boom and bust cycles These fluctuations have roots in a variety of factors including political instability mismanagement of resources and external shocks such as changes in global commodity prices and natural disasters Since its creation in 1947, Pakistan has found itself in a precarious financial situation multiple times, necessitating assistance from the International Monetary Fund. Since 1958, the country has entered in more than 20 agreements with the IMF, making it one of the most frequent users of IMF support in the world. This reliance on the IMF reflects deeper structural issues within the economy including persistent fiscal deficit a low tax base and a balance of payments crisis aap bataiye bijli ki qeemte din ba din badhti ja rahi hain uska jo bojh hai barah raaz uska bojh aam awam par aa raha hai aap dekhiye ki log khudkushiyan kar rahe hain log apna ghar bech rahe hain apni jaydadein bech rahe hain gaon dehat mein log apne maveshi bech kar bill pay kar rahe hain kya ye unko relief mila hai While the dip in inflation may provide a glimmer of hope in Pakistan, the road ahead is fraught with challenges. The combination of IMF imposed austerity measures and ongoing economic instability poses significant risks for the average Pakistani household, raising many questions about the long-term sustainability of these reforms and their real impact on daily life. How Pakistan handles the challenging journey to economic recovery will define its future. And with that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.